my role really is to give a little bit of context to uh, to the to the review that we're doing, um, uh, some of the national context, some of the context around population change, some of the context around uh, evidence about how uh, how services are best uh, best delivered. So we'll we'll start by talking about some of the things that we that we know uh, about uh, about Belper uh, and its population. Within the NHS, we don't have to make cuts. We don't have to save money. What we do have to do is make the money we've got go an awful <coughs> lot further. Um, what this graph shows is the age spread of uh, the population uh, within southern Derbyshire. So uh, men on the left, so the number of men in that age group, the number of women in that age group. The <coughs> lines on the outside um, are uh, national figures uh, and national predictions of the age groups that there will be in the future. But in general, as people get older and are moving up that, the, 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 the number of people being born and living isn't changing very much. Um, what is changing, so there's a gap up in this, in the over 70s age group, so uh, the number of people in those age groups now compared to where they'll be in 20 years' time is quite substantially different. Um, and that causes all sorts of problems for... Uh, the NHS specifically and, and society as a whole. Same information <laughs> presented in a slightly different way. So this is uh, the predicted growth in the over 90s uh, hit across Amber Valley. Um, so as we can see this year we've got about 1,300 people who, who are over 90. Um, by 2035 um, we've got three times that many people living over 90. So why, why is it a problem that we've got lots of over 90s? A surprising number of them are quite robust and independent and active and do lots of things. However, their reserve is much less and their ability to bounce back is so much less. If you get flu when you're 94, uh, there's a really good chance you won't survive it. What does that mean for the sort, sorts of diseases we've got in, in the Belper area? So this is information that's taken from, from GP computer systems. Um, and they're some of the, the common long-term conditions or chronic diseases that people tend to live with. Uh, the pattern here, I think, tells us something about the population in, in Belfast. So we've got quite a lot of dementia, not so much lung disease. The, this is some of the data from, uh, from hospitals and hospital admissions. And again, it, it's an indication that we've got older people and they tend to be slightly off so we haven't got too much in the way of alcohol and drug problems um, what what is it that we want to change about how services are delivered uh, in communities um, uh, we've spent some time actually thinking about how to do that and have got uh, a vision this is where we want it to go each local area so the local area think Delper and surrounding uh, we'll have a single health and social care team, so bringing health and social care together uh, with general practice at its centre. Um, I always feel the need to clarify that general practice at the centre bit because I'm a GP and I don't want to appear too self-serving. Um, but, um, but I think it's important that that's the case for two reasons. Firstly, in communities... Um, uh, GPs are the senior clinicians in communities. That's where the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the clinical hierarchy uh, uh, comes to a, comes to a head with general practice and general practitioners. Um, the other thing about general practice is it's where the vast majority of healthcare happens uh, across Southern Derbyshire CCG. We estimate that there there are about twenty thousand consultations every single day in general practice. Um, that's an order of magnitude greater than anywhere else in the health system uh, and social care as well. So there is a lot going on in general practice. Um, it's a big organisation or a big group of organisations. We've taken a decision that that's where we want to start. We want to start with general practice uh, and build it out from there. Um, uh, quite a brave decision because, as I've just said, it's not an easy thing to do, but that's, that's, our, that's our plan. Uh, politicians have used competition and choice as quite a blunt tool 
to to drive um, uh, to drive innovation and efficiency and quality. What that's done is it means you've got to have separate organisations, and if you've got separate organisations who are being set up to say you must compete, actually what you do is you focus on your organisation's needs. Um, we want them to meet patients' needs, not organisational needs, not professional groups' needs, not actually patients' needs. And they need to do that regardless of provider. So you've got all these different boundaries. Um, there are some places where people work beautifully across those boundaries and there are other places where there is conflict. Um, actually, we need to somehow uh, remove some of those boundaries. Um, easier said than done, but we need to do it. Part of the problem with having that fragmented pattern of lots of organisations and lots of professional groups is that if somebody has a good idea, it's enormously difficult to put that idea in into place, particularly if it's across more than one organisation, because you've got to go up through the hierarchy of all the organisations who are involved for somebody at the top who doesn't really know what the idea <coughs> is to make a decision if, whether it's okay, and then it's got to come back down again, and it comes back down from all the different organisations with a spin on it from all the different organisations' hierarchies. So that means that actually getting change done is really frustrating, really slow, and people just give up and don't, don't bother. Actually we need to be able to give local teams some, um, some empowerment and some ability to, to do things themselves without having to go up through the hierarchies. Over the last 10-20 years the vast majority of investment in the NHS has gone into the big shiny hospitals, much less so into community services and much less so into mental health services. So in the middle, people empowered to look after themselves. What does that mean? Um, we know um, that people with long-term conditions particularly do far better if they understand the conditions they've got. They know what the medication there is and why they're taking it. They know what lifestyle things they can do to improve it. They know what their blood tests mean and whether it's good or bad or going up and down. If people understand what it is that's wrong with them, they make better choices. The next ring around that is, um, uh, is about communities. Um, uh, not communities, health care or social care, but communities in, in a broader sense. Um, communities empowered to look after each other. And those sorts of things make a big, big difference to people's lives and to communities. Simple things, bigger than that, linking people who can't look after their gardens anymore with people who are looking for, who are on the allotment waiting list. Mm -hmm. Really obvious stuff, but just giving people permission. The next ring around, it's self-managed, geographically based multi-agency community support, uh, bringing the health, uh, general practice, community nursing, uh, social care, mental health together in communities so they can work as one team and they can self-manage. Service development, where there are some more people in that single team that, that, that we've brought in. Uh, we've got more community matrix than we had. Uh, Long-term condition specialist support. That's uh, what I was talking about earlier around specialists spending a bit more time supporting generalists rather than seeing people uh, directly. Uh, if you do that, you, uh, up, you, you increase the skill and the confidence within, uh, within, uh, within your team. Um, community beds. Um, this has been one of our biggest successes over the last couple of years. We've commissioned, commissioned um, beds in communities from care homes. Now, in the past, we're talking about the way things are fragmented. We've got, oh, care homes, they're over there, they do their thing, once somebody's there, that's, that's it. We've started using them uh, for two things, actually. Um, one is uh, for people reaching the end of life, for the last sort of days, weeks of their life. Um, you're coming to the end of your life and people recognise it and, uh, and can plan for it. Most people can manage to stay at home for that, if that's what they want. In the past, what tended to happen was you'd end up in hospital or you'd end up in the Macmillan unit, which is in the hospital. We started saying, actually, why, if we can put that care around people at their own, in their own home, if they've got enough support around them, why can't we do that in a care home? If you're at the end of your life having a room of your own, having somewhere where you can go and have a meal and sit up and talk to people uh, in hospitals. It tends to be you sit in your bed and... Uh, so they're, they're better at it than community hospitals. 
The other thing that we've used community beds for is as a sort of a, a step down rather than a discharge from, from acute hospitals. When you're poorly in hospital is not the time or the place to decide that you're going to move house and live there for the rest of your life. Um, actually, you need a bit of time to think about that. You need a bit of time to choose where you're going to live. You need a bit of time to get a bit better so you know actually what it is, is you're going to need. Um, so using community, um, using care homes uh, to give people some time to think and do that is a much better place to do that than it, in a hospital bed. Um, we can get some support around you, so care support, nursing support, and the physio comes to you once a day and does that 40 minutes rehab. And then the rest of the day, you've got to get yourself to the loop and you've got to make yourself some food and you've got to and you're in your own environment you know where to hold on to keep you safe you know what's likely to trip you up you've got control over your telly you've got control over your telephone all those sorts of things means that rehabilitation in people's homes is far far more successful than it is in, in, in a community hospital uh, better planning for discharge from hospital um, when people go into hospital we are now starting to talk to them about what is going to happen when they go home from the minute they go in, rather than wait until they've had all the medical care and they go, OK, now we need to get you out, what are we going to do? Uh, but certainly, um, within our health and social care community, we are talking together in the same room as each other far more than we were five, three, four years ago. Um, um, that's yet to translate into really good integrated teams on the ground, but we're getting there and, uh, and the hierarchy of, 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 of is talking in that way. And nobody's saying it's easy. It's, it's going to be really, really difficult, but that's what we've got to do.